on this week's show on thin ice in the Alps. If we see something is not as we wish, then we either shorten the race or we cancel the races. The best kit for a COVID-free break. Admittedly, I do feel a little bit silly doing this, but I know how effective UVC light is, so I'd like to think it's working. <laughs> and eating our way around Azerbaijan. That is so creamy. It's really delicious. We're starting this week 1,800 metres above sea level in the shadow of an alpine valley. This is San Moritz in the Swiss Alps. It's the place, so they say, where the concept of the winter holiday was born. It also occupies a unique place in sporting history. It's where the bobsleigh was created. But skiing is an even stranger sporting event than that. The race is a wild mix of horses, skiing, all done over this frozen lake. The white turf event has happened every year since 1907, pausing only for COVID in 2021. It sees three days of racing on ice, with the skewering event as its climax. 10,000 people have turned up to see it, but this year there were question marks hanging over its comeback year. Races at the first weekend had to be shortened after water came through what's normally reliably thick ice. Organisers say they were forced to impose limits on the weight of some of the attractions. The drilling of the holes, that's the very traditional way to check the track. Mm -hmm. And because you drill through the snow, through the very compact snow, until you get to the ice. And then you see whether there's some water somewhere. The water comes from fissures in the lake and then some water can come up. In the morning there's shadow, so it's really cold. The sun comes up, it can change very quickly. And if we see something is not as we wish, then we either shorten the race or we cancel the races. It's always those weather changes which make the ice work. So we had some water around the winning post. Okay. So we had to take the winning post a little bit further back. And we only had 800 meters. They did some measurements to see the level when the crowd comes on mm -hmm. Sunday and I think it's about half a meter that it all goes down and up. Okay. So people have expectations. It's not a normal race course. Mm -hmm. I mean, on another race course, if it's raining and it's very wet, then you can say, oh, it's going to be wet on Sunday or we mm -hmm. cancel the races. Here, it can look perfect. And then on Sunday morning, I have to say, I'm sorry, security goes first, we cannot do the races. Horses come from Germany, they come from England, they come from France. Thoroughbreds are brought here from all over Europe and fitted with specially adapted race shoes made with added grooves to grip the snow and ice. I want to please the expectations of the people, which is not always easy. But safety comes first, right? Safety comes first. I mean, I have my own horses. I'm very much into animal welfare and safety for horses and of course for the jockeys as well. It's just mm -hmm. not negotiable. <laughs> yes. Luckily, they were able to run a full schedule, allowing the crowds to see races all afternoon in the below freezing temperatures. 
Before the main event, the skewering, I caught up with Valeria, who's been crowned overall winner here twice in past years. Before the first race, I always said, oh wow, why am I doing that? And after the race, I say, yeah, I know why. <laughs> 2009, I was the first woman to do skewering. It was really special because everyone was looking at me. Ah, can she do that? Is she strong enough? Is she not scared and everything? But it was really nice because I had directly a third place in my first race. Can you control the horse with the reins and how different is it for the horse? We definitely can control them, we have to control them because if there is something uh, next to you, you have to go left or you have to go right, you have to stop the horse if something happened. After the starting stall, they normally say, OK, where is my boss? Oh, OK, it's, it's six meters behind me. And uh, they sometimes really looking for you and try to connect you with, with the reins. Mm -hmm. And some horses, they love to do it. They say, wow, there is nobody on it, I go. So the big race is coming up and I've placed a small bet on Valeria, so watch out for the lady in pink. She's not the favourite, but fingers crossed. Point, Valeria was in the lead and looking good. For the riders, the sheer amount of snow and ice kicked up by the horse's grooves mean face protection is pretty important. By the final lap, you could see the horses beginning to tire, and she was desperately trying to hang on. So our rider came fourth, unfortunately, but it did look like a really tough race. They came round three times, and gosh, these horses were going so fast. It was really thrilling. Switzerland's got some of the most beautiful train journeys in the world, especially in spring when you can see greenery re-emerge on the alpine hillsides. The Benina Express is among the world's steepest railways to operate without gears or aids, and the stretch from Thusis to Tirano is on UNESCO's World Heritage List for outstanding designs of its tunnels, viaducts and bridges. The Trummelbach Falls reopened for summer this month and they're well worth a look. They carry the meltwaters from the Jungfrau mountain down to the valley below. 20,000 litres pour over the edge every second along with tons of boulders, the force of which causes the entire mountainside to shudder. Switzerland's known for being quite pricey but has an excellent network of youth hostels if you're on a budget. There's around 50 dotted around the country, and there's plenty of variety from ones in castles and stately homes to something a bit more modern and urban. Expect to pay an average of around 90 euros a night for a double room. And finally, your lunch could help fund dinner for someone who really needs it. The recently reopened Refettorio Geneva calls itself a solidarity kitchen. Go along for a 30 euro three course lunch and they'll reinvest that money on feeding some of the poorest in Geneva. The philosophy is that social good can still be delivered in a fine dining setting. Still to come on this week's show. Lucy's here to road test the kit that aims to keep you COVID free on your travels. In fact, 
It's not really that different to any mask that I've been wearing over the past couple of years. The only difference being is that this is loaded with tech and it connects to an app. And Kate Hardy Buckley takes her taste buds on a tour of Azerbaijan. So juicy and tart. It's going all over the place. <laughs> so don't go away. In recent years, traveling has taken on a whole new dimension. Since COVID emerged, we have all been forced to think about the health of us and of those around us more than ever before. Some travel health paraphernalia that we've come to know during COVID may be here for good. And as always, tech is here with a helping hand. So let's start with this. Depending on where you're traveling to, masks still might be needed. And even if not, this thing is future-proofed. The AirPop Active Plus Smart Mask uses disposable filters for you to swap out once you've been using it for too long, housed in a design that stands out from the crowd. So after seeing many, many pictures of this thing, I am pleasantly surprised by just how lightweight and comfortable it is. It's unobtrusive. In fact, it's not really that different to any mask that I've been wearing over the past couple of years. The only difference being is that this is loaded with tech and it connects to an app. The clever tech in here will actually monitor how long you've used it for and even the number of breaths you've taken. It sends the data to an app on your phone and using your location data tells you just how much harmful pollution that it's been filtering out wherever you are in the world. With COVID fears lingering, something that's designed to filter out airborne nasties can provide real peace of mind. Plus, I think it's really useful that something like this takes things a step further to tell you what you could be putting into your lungs wherever it is in the world that you're traveling to. Now, one thing to be aware of though, is that the accuracy of information depends on how close you are to an air pollution monitor. Plus, it's not the cheapest of masks if you're thinking of having something to just fling into your back pocket. But saying that, this is far from your bog standard mask. Next up, it's the CleanPod UVC Sterilizer from Monos. In a gadget small enough to toss in your hand luggage, this thing might just help to put people who are worried about what they're touching at ease. With a push of a button, a high energy beam of ultraviolet sea light comes out from the LEDs, which the makers say effectively sanitizes surfaces without the use of chemicals. To zap the nasties, you position the wand about three centimetres above what you want sanitised. Admittedly, I do feel a little bit silly doing this, but I know how effective UVC light is, so I'd like to think it's working. UVC works by scrambling the bacteria's genetic code so they can no longer function. So I guess the real burning question here is, does something like this provide more peace of mind than say a disposable wipe that's more tangible and actually makes you feel like you're cleaning something? Of course, I think it depends on the user, but this really is a nifty way to sanitize surfaces and objects without chemicals or liquids. It's fantastic for door handles, keyboards, telephones, toilet seats, and basically anything you can wave this thing over. Now to the world of apps, which have come to the aid of the travelers during the pandemic who need somewhere to put their COVID vaccine certificates. But with so many around now, which ones should you consider using? The problem that these apps are trying to solve it, the, is that there's no common way to upload certification to uh, airlines. And some airlines have decided to trial the IATA travel pass. You upload the certification for your tests, vaccines and so on to it, and that's then transmitted to the airline. It's still basically in trial form at this stage, but it's really promising. So having it in one centralised system, which you would hold on your phone like any other app, would be very sensible. I, I think this will just become a part of a part of travel life um, in the way that perhaps 10 or 15 years ago um, it would have been completely unthinkable that we all use mobile check-in, right, and show boarding passes on our phones or watches, and a computer in your phone was powerful enough to do so. That's a fairly new uh, innovation. As with so much else in aviation, COVID has proven a real accelerator here. Last but not least, I have the Thermo Smart Temporal Thermometer from Withings. So once you switch this thing on, it measures your temperature using your temporal artery, which runs across your forehead to your temple. It's all over very quickly in around two seconds and it vibrates to let you know it's done. There's my temperature. I then scroll to my profile, Lucy, that's me. Click the button, 
and it tells me I'm fever free because it's green, something I'm sure my cameraman is very pleased to hear. And pressing that button also means it syncs your data to a dedicated app on your smartphone. This is no ordinary thermometer. It uses 16 infrared sensors to take 4,000 measurements in just a couple of seconds. And maybe best of all, there's no contact involved. So what you're looking at here is a really non-invasive way to record your temperature. It's personalised and I think it's a really nice touch that you're able to keep track of your fever over time. The fact that you can store up to eight user profiles as well makes it ideal for families or when travelling with a big group for example. And yes, it's pricey, it's a little costlier than traditional thermometers or non-connected thermometers, but during these Covid times being able to keep tabs on your temperature will certainly make you feel a lot better when travelling. Finally this week we're back on the road with Kate Hardy Buckley as she tours the markets, farms, kitchens and restaurants of some of the world's most exciting cities. This week she's in Azerbaijan. They call this country the land of fire thanks to its huge oil and gas reserves. But this fiery place is also known for its hospitality. People here show their love through their food. And whilst Baku is renowned for its luxurious products such as caviar, Chef Etiram has built his reputation showcasing wholesome, hearty dishes. Welcome to Baku. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. This is a beautiful view. Azerbaijan is a very large country. We know that there are a lot of food products in the city and the road is on the road. There are also plows, dolma, balık, deniz məhsulları, balık şeyler var hamısı və biz bərabər ondan sizinlə pişirəcəyik. What are the ingredients you would like me to get you? Əsas mənə lazım olacaq deməli zəfəran, safran. Okay. Sonra balıq kürüsü, kaviyar. Kaviyar? Yes, yes. Oh my goodness. Wow. Və nar. Narın elə bil özü və nar şərab. Onları gətirsiniz, mən sizə gözəl yemək pişirəcəm. My culinary adventure begins south of Baku at a sustainable caviar fish farm located in the historical sturgeon spawning area between the Kura River and the Caspian Sea. There's thousands of them. The earliest chance to get a caviar is a three years, but for example, beluga, it matures for 12 to 15 years wow. before it's ready to bring the caviar. There has been a worldwide ban on wild sturgeon caviar since 2006. So the caviar you can buy comes from places like here. Rufat tells me Baku Caviar is on a mission to replenish the fish stock in the Caspian Sea. For every jar that you purchase, we release 10 fishes into the wild. They keep bobbing up and down. They are kids and they want to play. <laughs> he was particularly friendly. Rufat shows me the fish they're processing today for the caviar and the fish meat. This is a blunt beluga and it's very valuable caviar that wow. they will produce. So the caviar has just been extracted from the sturgeon and here the caviar master, they're responsible for panning it to make sure that what you're left with here is the beautiful caviar. And that is so creamy. It's kind of a nutty taste. It's really delicious. I travel to the Greater Caucasus Mountains north of Baku to a pomegranate orchard as pickers harvest the fruit to turn into wine. We are locating between two mountain chains and the soil is super fertile and that gives the richness and the uniqueness to the pomegranate. We start the harvesting late autumn, uh, like first uh, week of October and it lasts the uh, beginning of the December. Mm. So juicy and tart. It's going all over the place. <laughs> it's a delicious but a messy fruit. <laughs> Every delicious thing is the messy. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> AZ Granata is a leading producer of pomegranate wine, created using a similar process as wine from grapes, with sugars, fermentation and barreling. Before returning to Baku, I stopped to pick up what people often call red gold, saffron. 
the expensive part of the saffron is this, three stigmas. We get one kilogram saffron from 117,000 of flowers. The Apsheron Peninsula is perfect for the very best saffron thanks to its sandy soil. It's been handpicked here for over 1,000 years. There is 300 types of saffron, but the most beneficial and most expensive is this. In fact, Apsheron saffron is said to be the fourth most expensive ingredient in the world. It only flowers 25 days a year. I'm now all set for Chef Etiram. Wow! Quite a lot. Here we go. We're making piti, a lamb and chickpea stew from Chef Etiram's home region. Yani biz çeki deniyiz. Yani Azerbaycan ümmetle konakberber kalktı ve bizim ailemizde hemşe yemek pişirildi ve ona göre de metbaşa sevgim uşak baklarımlandı. So we're now adding two chestnuts and the saffron. Piti was traditionally a worker's dish, as one serving provides enough nourishment for the day. Accompanied by our pomegranate wine. You think it's going to be very sweet, but it's actually like a grape wine. It's very smooth, very gentle taste. There's actually two stages to the piti. There's a lovely soup, which you eat with bread, and then there's the mashed up contents of the stew. Mmm. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> Kate Hardy Buckley getting a taste of some delicious hearty food in Azerbaijan, which I could do with right now, standing out here in the cold. Anyway, that's it for this week. Coming up next week. Chris is looking over some of our best bits from the past few months, from her emotional trip home to Australia as borders began to open, to Lucy's sizzling encounter with a full English breakfast. This is a lot of food. I'm going to try my hardest. And you can follow more of our recent adventures on the BBC iPlayer. And don't forget we're on social media too. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Just search BBC Travel Show and look for that blue logo. So it's Auf Wiedersehen from the Swiss Alps and I'll see you next time.